Okay, I know this is almost getting to the end of the conference. Hopefully, I'll make it interesting for you guys. Okay, thank you for the intro. Um, let's see. Okay, how many of you use eBay here? And how many of you sell on eBay? Still a few hands. Good, thank you. Thank you for being an eBay customer. <laughs> uh, another question before I get started and what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, does anyone know what is the first item that was ever sold on eBay 20 years ago? Coin. Pardon me? A coin. A coin? Nice crack. Just a red laser pointer. First one, and a broken one too. <laughs> anyway, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about three things. Uh, mainly about commerce experiences to start with so that you understand what kind of scale do we operate, right? When we talk about big data and what kind of data science problems. So second thing is, what are our data scientists in e at eBay, what kind of use cases are they trying to solve? And the third is the open platform, and that's where my team comes in. And what we're doing is, you might definitely have heard of all these things about Spark, and there was a keynote on Jupiter, there was another talk on Zeppelin. How do these all come together, and, and what are we doing inside eBay to build an open platform to enable our data scientists? Okay, first let me start with a, with a story. So you start understanding who our customers are and what are we trying to do for them. So, uh, so this person's name is Ed Church, and again, there's a nice video about him. And uh, so he was a passionate Harley Davidson biker, and at one point in life, due to different hardship, he had to sell his bike. Uh, but after 30 years, many life changes, he was ready to go back and buy a Harley Davidson. So he goes to eBay and starts searching for Harley Davidson, and lo and behold, he actually finds exactly the same Harley Davidson that he sold 30 years ago. Exactly the same win number. So he bids on it, thinking what it would be worth, what's the market, he doesn't get it. And he's so regretful about it. A year later, he goes back and he bids what it's worth for him and he gets it. So he talks about an emotional story of how eBay was able to connect him to his passion. So at eBay, what we're trying to do is to really connect people to their interests, their likes, and wants. And this is some of the things that I wanted to resonate with you is, with what, are we, what are we doing with data? We're trying to solve people's mission, their purpose in life. And if you come from that outside-in perspective, yes, data ultimately are experiences encoded as zeros and ones. But how do you take the zeros and ones and again convert it to something that is of value to our end customers? And that's very important as we start looking at this. So what scale do we operate at eBay? Over 150 million buyers, some of you here, thank you. One sixth of them like sellers, posting about 800 million listings. Mobile is, is picking up over a billion listings just via mobile. In terms of velocity, again, we talk about the three Bs, but in terms of velocity, right, you can see it's a, a handbag sold in the US every five seconds a shoe in Australia a minute, and in Germany a car every 10 minutes. So that's the scale at which we operate. But when you look at the kind of the patterns that's happening in the commerce space, we're at an inflection point. What do I mean by that? Offline and off online are collapsing. We order something online, we go pick it up. When you're, you're driving through your mobile app, how many of you are in a store you like a product, you pick up your mobile app, scan the barcode, and do a price comparison and order online. Yes, I'm one of them. My wife taught me that. <laughs> so that's some of these things, right? The, we are on the go as customers. We start our shopping journey in one place, maybe on a desktop. We are commuting to home. We com convert through our mobile device, right? So that's a, that's a journey, and each of this has those data points. How can we correlate them? Secondly, customer expectations are changing. What do I mean by that? We are willing to give more of our data in exchange for better experiences. And we trust to whoever we're giving the data. Many times we download an app and it asks, do you want access, this is gonna access your photo, your calendar, blah, blah, blah. You say, okay, accept. Don't even look at what is the big block of this. 
But we have to be really mindful of all these data, right? At eBay, what are we seeing, right? There's different types of data, behavioral data, transactional data, demographic data, psychographic data. How do we take all of these at scale, hundreds of petabytes of data? We have over 10,000 nodes of Hadoop, processing over 100 petabytes of data. Some of our servers, one of our personalization server, a real-time server, receives over a billion calls a day. So that's the scale at which we operate. And when you look at it from a data standpoint, what do we see? It's all about connecting patterns. Take the example of Edge Church. How do we connect what device he's using? What is his demography? Where does he shop from? What kind of products he does? What is his past behavior? What is his ingestion behavior? All of these. And doing that scale is the challenge. Doing it for hundreds of users, thousands of users, even 100,000 is one set of problems. But doing it for over 150 million users at scale is a different challenge. So how do we do it? One example of this is we construct something called an activity timeline. So this is very helpful in, in, th in terms of personalization. How do you take historical activity, whether it be transactional, your clicks, your behavior activity, your searches, your bids, and create a customer profile? But there's also an intent. What are you doing at this point? And we kind of segment that into near line and online. Online is when you're actually on a device, on a canvas of eBay. But there's things that you could have also done over the past day or a few hours. That could be very different. But how do you take all of this and construct a profile of a particular user? So an example of what we do here in, at, at scale is we construct an offline model. We also call it a customer DNA. And then we take that, we load those attributes, those features, and some of these prediction predictive models into our personalization platform. When, when the user visits eBay, we don't just use the offline models, but we also take into account an in-session behavior. So let's think of it as almost a shortcut from an eBay canvas. It could be your website, it could be your tablet, but those are real-time events that actually flow into directly into the real-time platform. <laughs> And then there's a model that runs, and you're talking about response time anywhere between 20 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds for the 95th person dive. And then there are those experiences, different things. OK, there's a deals module. There is a search ranking module. All of these are actually trying to make use of these different predictive models to come up with those experiences. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the scale at which we operate. Now let me shift over to the second point of the topic, which is about data science. Right? What are our data science scientists doing at eBay? Right? So they take data, a key aspect of this, and I talked about the trust with data. It's all about governance. So within eBay, we have secure zones. Right? Not everybody can access every data set. So we have different levels, so I'm sure many, many corporations have this. But just getting access to some of this, we have to do what is called a 2FA, a two-factor authentication. So there are strict limits on who accesses what data for what purposes. And this also imposes certain constraints on what kind of platforms we can enable for our data scientists. Then you apply data science on top of it, and that's when you create value for the ed churches of the world. So some of the machine learning problems, right, to be more specific about some of these use cases are, again, the personalization use case I talked, search ranking is a common use case, uh, trust, we continuously predict which seller is going to in breach of a particular contract. Shipping, many times we go shop and we're trying to say, hey, can we predict the shipping time based on different features, right? This could be your from, your destination. It could also be the condition of the product, that seller type. So there's different things that go into predicting the shipping time. And then in customer support, right? Many times we go order at something online and we figure out, hey, I get antsy when I don't hear a status. A call to customer support is expensive for the customer, it's expensive for the company. How can we avoid that in a proactive way? So there are predictive models that are actually looking at your behavior on an iPad or on the website. Let's say you go and refresh your order or you're clicking on different things on the order. Can you predict and direct the user to a more seamless flow where they get more helpful information. So there's a lot of those kinds of models that's going to the customer support, dedicated teams working on that. 
uh, marketing, there was a talk in the morning by Jane, one of our eBay uh, colleagues. She talked about how they create propensity models, whether it be seller or email marketing. And then computer vision, a lot of very good work being done in the deep learning space. Looking at an image, when let's say you take an image and you post using your iPhone, can we look at and categorize and classify the product? So those are some of the deep learning use cases that we are getting into. So again, for some of the core hardcore machine learning experts, right? Again, there's a lot of different algorithms. Each of these domain teams are trying to use anywhere between a regression model to uh, a random forest, a, a tree base. Some of them are getting into neural networks also. Just, just to give you a sense of, OK, the different kinds of algorithms our teams are using internally. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what our data scientists are using. Now let's talk about how do we enable them. So when you look at machine learning itself, right? ultimately, what are we trying to do with data? Right? You're trying to create better experiences for humans. In our case, connecting buyers and sellers. How do we do that? We take data, we apply data science. In the case of machine learning, it's all about scale. How can the model learn and impact systems at scale? There's another route where you're taking data science and actually empowering other decision makers, right? Sometimes we call them as analysts, product managers. So how do you take, and then the humans in turn influence other marketing managers, other product managers, maybe the CEO, the CFO. So that is another route, right? So this is one of the key takeaways I want to take. When you look at data science, who are you actually helping? And if you are one of those persons, are you in the kind of the analyst path or are you in the machine learning path? Right? And what are your requirements on your technology teams to help you do your job better? So in our case, it's all about doing this at scale with the right governance model. OK, so this is like a, a typical machine learning. What I want to talk now about the challenges that I've typically faced, at least common patterns that we see. Right? So this is a, a basic machine learning life cycle. You start with getting data, you select features, you train, you evaluate. This is a very iterative process. It's always not a one-way street. Uh, then you deploy. It's challenges in every step of this process. 60 to 80 percent of the time is really in the first two. If you ask any big corporation where there's a lot of data, the number one problem is not actually doing them coming up with, hey, what algorithms I need to use. It's really, OK, how do you access the data? We have data in Hadoop. We have teradata. We have streams of data. How do you know what data to access? Is it fresh data? How can you get the data to a place where you can actually use? In our case, moving it out of a secure zone is compromising trust of our customers. So how do you make sure that any work that is done is actually done in a very compliant manner? So one of the things is the data aspect. But we keep hearing about new things popping up, a SPAR a Zeppelin, a drill, a edge tool. How do we provide quick and easy access to our data scientists so they're not spending downloading, installing software? Our PhD's time should be spent on trying to solve really hard problems, not installing software or connecting different data systems. So those are the challenges that our data scientists today face. And it even gets worse. Let's say you are able to successfully get the data, but then you probably, a lot of scientists today at eBay, they have a shared server that they run it on. Or some of them have managed to get the budget to run a high mem machines on their desktop. Some still do it on, on, on their laptops. But if you want to run it on 10 gigs of data, and then you say, hey, OK, now I want to extrapolate this to 100 gigs of training data, they're not able to do that. How can you do that on a distributed cluster? Those kinds of challenges come. And in many cases, what happens is, Managing the life cycle of a model. Let's say you throw a V1 of a model out, and then you want to learn the feedback loop. It's not easy. Or an employee leaves. What happens to the model? Can you capture a snapshot of the features and the model that was actually went into the V1? So the next time you have feedback, you can go back and say, hey, I want to actually better this model. It's not in a laptop. It was returned back to your IT and then when the employee left. So those are some of the things that we're looking at when we start looking at platforms at scale. And then there's always the collaboration. Hey, can we have collaboration between multiple data scientists? And also the community aspect. Let's say there are features that are curated data sets. Can we share those? Can we also get to the point where certain of the models or algorithms that one part of eBay, 
somebody in a merchandising team develops can be used by the search ranking team, or at least enhanced from that. So those are some of the things that we really start looking at when we want to look at the next generation of our data science platform. So one of the things that my team is getting started on is looking at, hey, how can we have big believers, big adopters, and even big contributors back into the open community? We've done many contributions to Hadoop. Uh, we continue doing to the OpenStack. Our private cloud is based on OpenStack. So what we're trying to get started now is on this exciting journey to build a machine learning platform entirely based off of OpenStack. So what are the bits and pieces of this? Uh, it is going to be on a private cloud. Uh, we will make data pipelines easy, uh, API access, web UI, but a lot of our data is still on Hadoop. So how do we make sure that, hey, we're not actually moving. In some cases, it's okay to move the data to where the compute is. But in other cases, you want the compute to run where the data is called data locality. How do you make sure that you're actually running jobs where your data is? So those are some of the things that we're trying to do in the core of, okay, then adopting Spark. It, some algorithms, you can run it in a distributed way. Some, you cannot. So the concept of what we're trying to do with this data platform is, as a data scientist, you come in and you say, hey, give me your workspace. And what it does, it creates the best of read tools. It provisions access to a Spark cluster, a H2, a notebook interface with Jupyter for, for you as a data scientist and then provides you the right mechanisms so you don't have to worry as a data scientist to go and say, okay, should I, should I be worrying about plumbing? The 60 to 80 person, can we shave a big chunk of it? So then you come in and say, okay, my workspace, think of it if you're a software developer, it's called an IDE, right? It's my workspace, my data space, is it all set for me in minutes? Now I can just focus on moving my data is done for me, it takes hours, but, also, but I don't need to go and figure out how to move the data. I have the right tools for me. Can I just start using it? So that's, that's really what we're trying to enable with this. Now, there's a thing that data scientists obviously need a choice of tools. There's new tools popping up. So how do you, it's not about just saying, hey, okay, I need to upgrade the version of Spark, the version of H2, right? There's new things. And, and we had one use case where one of the data scientists was saying that, hey, I developed a cool GBM model during my grad days. And that's what I typically use. So what, what they're asking for is not just, okay, what's out there, but also a flexibility in terms of software. I want to be able to plug in an XGBoost, which is one of the R uh, algorithms that's very popular these days. So in my machine learning training pipeline, can I actually plug in these tools? So one of the things we are trying to do is not just, okay, give them out of the box what's out there in the open source, but ability to be flexible enough so when we construct a model training pipeline in the different phases of the blocks, can they, pipe, can they plug in like a, a sci-fi library? Can they plug in uh, XGBoost in different cases? So that's really what we are embarking on, where we try to build this end-to-end -end pipeline that is flexible from a software standpoint, but also flexible from a hardware standpoint. You want to run it on a single high mem machine with many G CPUs. Yes, you can run it. You want to run it on a distributed Spark cluster. You can run it. You want to do some deep learning using CAFE. Google came, came up with something called TensorFlow recently. Very exciting. We're looking at that space. So is that something that we can leverage as part of our platform? So that's how we're looking at the open machine learning platform so we can enable our data scientists to focus on the job that they really paid for, that, that, that they are passionate about, rather than the plumbing, installing software, figuring out how to actually deploy them. So it, it forms an end-to-end -end pipeline. You can manage the life cycle also better. Where do we want to get to? Ultimately, can we democratize machine learning? Where the core ML experts are creating models, are creating pipelines. You've seen Amazon machine learning, for example, you take data, you say, hey, I want to do a binary classification. I want to do a multi-classifier. I want to build a regression model. You don't care about whether it's a SPART or a H2O. In some cases, you may say, hey, I want to run it on a H2O and compare it with a SPARC MLA. Can we get to that higher order abstraction where some of our analysts, who are maybe not be hardcore machine learning experts, but all they care is I want to get from point A to point B. This is my data, run a classifier, show me the key metrics, give me the levers to tweak it, get a model out. And having our machine learning experts actually come up with these higher order abstractions. That's really what we're trying to get to here with the machine learning as a service. 
So underlying platform, I think I touched upon some of these aspects. You've heard this over the course of two uh, days here. Number one, easy connectivity to data, modeling, all of the tools that you've heard of, Jupyter, Zeppelin, H2. So we're trying to say, how do we package this, make it available as part of the workspace? Some can be run in a distributed cluster, some cannot. Can we run more deep learning? So our cloud itself is based on, uh, we're starting on an open stack, but we're also adopting something called Kubernetes, which is a Google-based open source cluster management framework. Some of, a lot of our data is still on Yarn, uh, in Hadoop, so we're running Spark on Yarn for that. So some of these could be like, hey, as part of your machine learning uh, pipeline, let's say you've done your exploratory work, you've done your data prep, and you say, I want to run it on large data sets. Can you spawn off jobs that run remotely on a Hadoop cluster? Right? Let's say you have a scaling job. Can you actually run it over there? So those are some of the things that we are looking at from an open data science platform and building this. Uh, hopefully this is all open, so at some point we can come back and give it back to you guys, to the open community, and have you guys contribute. So this is again in terms of the pipeline itself, starting from, okay, data sets to deployment. Deployment has its own set of challenges. Uh, but then getting the feedback loop. You throw a model out there, a V1, but you want to continuously learn. How do we have a continuous pipeline that gets the feedback into the model so then you can look at it and say, hey, okay, the model that I did one month ago had such an accuracy rate. But now, with changing dynamics, maybe the data is different, maybe there's new things that's come out in the external world that's impacting my model. How can you learn it in an automated way? So that's something that we are looking to build as part of this platform. So again, before I end my talk, we talked about three things, commerce experiences, what are we doing at scale, how are we enabling data scientists, and how are we building this open platform. Within eBay, hopefully at some point, we'll come back to you guys, give it, and have you guys contribute into the platform too. And one key takeaway, always think of this, use my data to help me, that's what our customers are telling. You as a customer, or you as a provider, need to always be thinking about this. Thank you. By the way, we are hiring, so we're looking for really solid distributed platform guys or even a machine learning experts that can contribute into the platform. So feel free to stop by, I'm going to be hanging around. So, questions? Cool. Thank you.